Lord's Day 50 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 50, which is the fourth petition. Give us this day our daily bread. That is, be pleased to provide us with all things necessary for the body, that we may thereby acknowledge thee to be the only fountain of all good, and that neither our care nor industry nor even thy gifts can profit us without thy blessing, and therefore that we may withdraw our trust from all creatures and place it alone in thee. Beloved, the fourth petition concerns our earthly needs. As the Heidelberg Catechism says, all things necessary for the body. Now in the early church, the church fathers began to question this petition. And they asked themselves, should we come down from the lofty heights of God's name and of God's kingdom and of God's will and now should we be asking for something as mundane and ordinary as bread? And as theologians often do, they begin to think and sometimes their thoughts go off in the wrong direction and they say to themselves, well perhaps the Lord doesn't simply mean bread, perhaps he means something else. And so they said, what this petition means is, give us the bread of life. Not earthly bread after all. And then you can see where we're going. This becomes the bread of the Eucharist. The bread of the Mass. And then they began to celebrate the Eucharist for the Mass daily because it's give us our daily bread. But that was a mistake in the early church, which of course has continued until this day in certain churches. But Christ is not bringing us down from the lofty heights to the ordinary and mundane, but rather he is bringing our ordinary needs to the attention of our Father, which is in heaven. Our Father would have us ask for our daily bread. It's not an insult to His Majesty that we come to Him asking for something as ordinary as bread. Our Father knows that we are dust. Our Father knows that we need bread to keep our body and soul together. And Christians recognize that God holds our body as something important as well as our soul. God has determined to save us, not simply in our souls, but also to save and to redeem our bodies. And besides, we as earthly creatures of the dust need bread so that we can fulfill the first three petitions. How can we bring honour to the name of God if we have no bread? And how can we promote God's kingdom unless we have bread? And how can we perform God's will unless we have bread? And so we use the bread which we get from this fourth petition. We use that bread in order to fulfill the other petitions of the Lord's Prayer. And in fact, if we do not use our bread for that purpose, it would be better for us to starve. And so you see that this fourth petition is placed at the beginning of the second half of the Lord's Prayer. You can divide it into six different petitions. The first three deal directly with God, with God's name, with God's kingdom, and with God's will. And the last three deal more with our particular needs. We need our daily bread. We need the forgiveness of our sins, our debts, as we'll see next time. And we need to be protected from temptation and delivered from 
evil. But it all begins for us with bread. We are not angels. We need bread. We need food. And God, in His mercy, permits us, indeed commands us, to ask of Him our necessary food, our daily bread. Let's look at this fourth petition then, under the theme, praying to Father for our daily bread. Praying to Father for our daily bread. Notice first the bread which we seek, or which we need, the blessing which we seek, and the dependence which we express. The fourth petition asks for bread. And bread, of course, stands for all of the basic necessities of physical life. And think of, just for a moment, what is involved in that one little word, bread. When we ask for our daily bread, we do not ask the loaf of bread fall from heaven onto our plate ready sliced. That's not how it works in God's providence. So we're asking for much more than simply a loaf of bread. We're asking, for example, that the entire economy and society in which we live will, for the sake of God's church, prosper so that we can eat and be supplied with the necessities of earthly life. The saying is, no man is an island. And God is pleased so to order the world so that we live in society, so that one man depends upon the work of another man, and even in the production of one humble loaf of bread, many men and much industry is involved. That's the wonder of God's providence. The farmer who grows the grain to make the bread. He depends upon God, whether consciously or unconsciously, he depends upon God to send the sun and the rain so that the, the grain can ripen in the field. He depends upon the oil industry to supply the diesel or the petrol to run his machinery so that he can then harvest the grain. And also for the various lorries and trucks and vehicles which come to take that grain and transport it to the factory. And the factory also depends upon all other kinds of industries so that the factory can take that grain make it into flour, and then make that flour into bread, and then we need more transportation to supply all of the shops and the supermarkets with these loaves of bread, so that the people who aren't farmers are able to go to the shop and buy that bread. And it may be required that the whole economy prosper to a certain degree so that businesses can hire people who aren't farmers, so that they can make enough money so that they can then go to the shop and buy the bread that the farmer has produced. All of that, all of it, is included in that one petition, give us this day our daily bread. Also, when we make this petition to God, we're asking Him to supply us with employment so that we will be able, especially husbands and fathers who are to be the chief breadwinners, are able to support their families and able, therefore, to buy this bread. All the way back in Genesis 3, verse 19, God said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. God does not simply drop bread from heaven onto your plate. God has determined that a man shall eat bread in the way of his working. And God has revealed in his word that the one who refuses to work because he is too busy 
and would prefer to live off the work of others, either his family or the government, that person shall not eat. For example, the soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing. That word slugger means a lazy, idle person who will not work. Proverbs 13, verse 4. The slugger will not fly by reason of the cold. It's too cold outside to go outside and fly, he says to himself. Therefore shall he beg and have nothing. And then 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10 in the New Testament says, If any will not work, neither shall he eat. And so when we ask God to give us our daily bread, we're asking him, Father, give me work. Give me a job where I can earn sufficient money to supply myself and my dependents with bread. And Father, give me diligence in my work. And give me the physical and mental ability to do my work. So we're asking in this petition for more than simply a loaf of bread. And so you can see that this fourth petition is connected back to the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment says you work for six days and then you rest on the, on the seventh day in order to worship God. There is no worshiping God and resting in good conscience on the Lord's day if there have not been previously to that conscious effort to work in order to earn your daily bread. Now under that word bread also, more is included than simply bread itself. As the Heidelberg Catechism very sensibly puts it, all things necessary for the body. A human being is not simply a mouth to feed. If I give a human being simply bread, and enough bread to survive, but I leave him outside in the cold, naked, that's not going to help him very much. The basic needs of a human being are these, food, clothing, shelter, and warmth. And with those four basic things, a human being is able to survive. So what you're asking for here is to be able to afford food and drink, somewhere to live, heating, and to pay for your basic utilities. And in our age, you could add to that transport. Because if you have a job, you need to be able to get to your job. Or if you don't have a job, and your husband has a job, and you're staying at home, you need to be able to get to the shops in order to buy the food for your family. You can add to that too, medicine, health, care as it were, in case a person becomes ill. So food, clothing, shelter, warmth, transport, and health. But that's it. You might think that this is too long already, but that's it. We have to be very careful in our modern age of materialism to remember that not everything that we want is a need. And wants can very easily become needs today. A foreign holiday is not a need. A widescreen television is not a need. A new car is not a need. Many things that we call needs are really just wants. And that's why too Christ has us ask for bread. Simply bread. Because bread is the basic foodstuff 
of life. In Christ's day, the common people would eat bread. Perhaps they would eat with that bread some fish or some figs or olive oil, but that was basically their diet. And Christ does not tell his disciples that they should eat or that they should ask for fish or figs, but simply bread. So when we ask in this petition, give us this day our daily bread, we're asking for simply what we need and not for luxuries. Give me bread, Father. Give me food, but simply bread is all I'm asking for. Give me clothing to cover my naked body. But I'm not asking for the desired meals. I'm just asking for my basic necessity. Give me shelter from the elements. Not a mansion, not a cottage by the lake, but simply a house or flat that suits my needs. Give me transportation. Not a Mercedes, necessarily. Maybe even a bicycle or money for the bus. Not luxuries, necessities. And God often, in his wondrous generosity, is pleased to give us luxuries. We all know that he gives us much more than simply giving us bread. And when he gives us more than we ask for, we are thankful to him. But we don't ask for more than bread. Bread is our request. And with bread we must be content. Add to that our daily bread. Daily bread means enough bread measured out sufficient to feed us for one day. We're asking for our daily bread. The Israelites learned about the concept of daily bread in the wilderness when they were fed every day with manna from heaven. God commanded the heavens to rain down manna, a kind of heavenly bread. And there was only enough for one day. And God said to his people, you may go out there and gather enough for you and everyone in your household for one day. But you may not store it up for another day. You may not hoard it. Notice, he made them gather it. They had to work to gather it for themselves. But he only gave them enough for one day at a time. And you read in the book of Exodus that the people did not obey him. They tried to hoard it for one or two or three days more. But when they did, it always would breed worms or maggots and stink. And there was one exception to that. On the day before the Sabbath, they had to gather enough for two days so that they wouldn't gather it on the Sabbath day. And then it would not stink. But every other day, they would only gather enough for one day. Now we find it difficult in our modern age of riches and materialism to pray this prayer sincerely. Give us this day our daily bread. Because I dare say that every one of us here this morning has cupboards filled with food and freezers filled with food so they have enough food for one, two, three days, maybe weeks, maybe even months, some of us. And so how can we utter a prayer here that says, give us this day our daily bread. And we are in danger as well of becoming accustomed to having a freezer or a cupboard filled with food. And then when God one day decides only to give us enough for one day, we will begin to grumble and complain. We'll say, but you always give me more than just bread. And now I am down to reduced rations of only bread. What's going on? Well, our prayer is bread. 
daily bread. No more than that. That does not mean we should feel guilty because we have more than that. But we must not squander it. We must not use it foolishly. We must be good stewards of what God gives us, remembering that God will hold us to account for what we did. There's nothing wrong with prudent foresight. There's nothing wrong with going to the shop once a week to buy your groceries and keep it in the cupboard. Of course not. We, should, we must not live like risers or selfishly either. But we must remember that we still are living according to God's commandment of daily bread. Think of your freezer at home, filled with food. A power cut could wipe the whole thing out. A thief could come and steal it. A house fire could destroy the whole thing. A flood or a storm, like happened a few weeks ago in Dublin, a flash flood. I'm sure people had all kinds of food in their cupboards that has now gone bad. They lost it all. You must remember that we are actually living each day in conscious dependence upon God. And that's something that this man, Agur, in Proverbs 30, had come to understand. We know nothing about this man, Agur, except he was the son of Jacob. But we know that he was a man who had wisdom. And thus he writes part of the book of Proverbs. And his prayer in this chapter 30 of Proverbs is remarkable. He says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Now we can all pray, and I dare say, the first part of that prayer. Give me not poverty. Don't give me poverty. Who wants to have poverty? Poverty brings misery especially in the day of the Old Testament, when if you were poor, you lived in terrible circumstances. There was no welfare system in that day. Either you work, or you beg, or you starve to death. That was the lot of the poor in the Old Testament. But Agur, he prays against Poverty, because he knows that poverty brings with it temptation. And that is steal. Lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Notice that Agar understands that that will be the temptation of the poor, to steal. But notice that Agar does not say, Oh, it's justifiable for the poor to steal. No, he says, if he were to do that, he would take the name of his God in vain. There's no Robin Hood mentality here with Agar. He knows that to steal, even if it's necessary to feed yourself and your family, he knows that that would be sinful. But what about the next part of the spring? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Don't give me riches, he said. Don't make me rich with the things of this world. How few people could pray that? Is it not true that our society is madly following after riches? That riches is what most people dream about? That's why they do the lottery, for example. They want to be rich. They think that riches will bring them everything that they possibly want and need. But Iger says, don't give me riches. There's a temptation in poverty to steal, and there's a temptation in riches to deny God. Verse 9, lest I be full, 
and rightly and say, Who is the Lord? It's very hard to be godly and to be rich. The Bible tells us that over and over again. It's very easy for someone who is rich to forget God, to become in love with his or her riches, and to become materialistic and godless. And so Agur, understanding that by the wisdom of God, asks not for poverty on the one hand, and not for riches on the other, but he asks for something in between. He asks for just enough. Feed me with food convenient for me, verse 8. Literally, cause me to eat my appointed portion. That's all I want, Lord. Lord, I confess that thou art wise and good, and that thou dost know exactly how much bread I need, and exactly how much bread would be good for me. Feed me not one crumb less, and not one crumb more. Simply give me what I need. That's the essence of our prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And with our daily bread, we seek God's blessing. Because without God's blessing, our daily bread will do us no good. What do we mean by God's blessing? We all, as Christians, say, bless this, bless that, bless the other thing. We talk about being blessed over and over again. But do we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be blessed? Well, the word blessing in the Bible means the word of God speaking good upon us or good concerning us so that all things work together for our good and serve our salvation, including and especially now, our food. The word bless in the Hebrew and Greek means to make a pronouncement upon someone, to speak about or concerning someone. And the Greek word especially means to speak good upon someone, or to speak good concerning someone. And specifically, it is God speaking good upon or concerning someone. And when God speaks good, when God blesses, a person is blessed indeed. So God's blessing is not a weak wish that God has that a person will be generally happy, that things will turn out okay for that person. But rather, God's blessing is the powerful word of his grace, which actually pronounces good upon his people and actually causes his people to be blessed so that when God blesses, no one can curse. And Proverbs 3, verse 33 says, God blesses the habitation of the just. In the house of the, of the godly person, God's blessing is there. It rests upon the house. God has said of the people in that house, the believers, those who belong to him, his elect children, I speak good upon them. I speak good concerning them. And they are blessed. And they shall be blessed. The opposite of God's blessing is, of course, God's curse. And if God's blessing is something wonderful, God's curse is something awful. It's the opposite of blessing. The word curse means to speak against someone, or to make a pronouncement of evil upon or concerning someone. 
And as we're speaking about God, God's curse is God speaking evil upon or concerning someone. And when God curses, a person is cursed indeed. God's curse is the word not of his grace, but of his wrath. And that wrath thrusts a person away from God, pronounces evil and ultimately damnation upon him, and finally expels him out of God's house, which is the world, into hell, where that person will be miserable for all eternity. When God blesses, a person is happy and blessed. When God curses, a person is cursed and miserable. And that same verse in Proverbs 3.33 says this, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. So you've got house, two different houses really. You've got the house of the wicked, God's curse is there. God has spoken against the people who live there. They are the wicked. God wills the destruction of the people who live there. And everything that they have is working together for their ultimate destruction. That's the idea of God's curse. And the mistake that many have made in the church is to find God's blessing on the one hand and God's curse on the other hand in material things. So that if a man has an abundance of food, clothing and health, that means that God is blessing him. And if a man does not have those things, he is poor, he has sickness in his life, other earthly miseries come upon him, that means that God is cursing him. And they look at the man's position in life, and they conclude, that man is blessed, and that man is cursed, because that man has lots of the things of this world, and that man has little of the things of this world, and in fact has much misery in his life. Now there's no doubt, of course, that the wicked often have many good things. In God's providence, God sees to it that many people who are wicked possess a lot of the things of this world. Think, for example, of people in Scripture, first of all, Pharaoh. King Pharaoh, in the book of Exodus, he was a man with tremendous wealth and power. God gave that to him. Or think of Nebuchadnezzar. He was a man who was the most powerful man upon the earth at that time. He lived a life of luxury. Think of people in history like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. Again, terribly wicked individuals. But look at the life that they had. They had everything that they could possibly want as far as the material things are concerned. And God today is still doing the same kind of thing. Look at the people in the world who have the riches of this world. Often they are the wicked. Often they have much of the world's goods. They're healthy. They seem to be happy. And none of that is an accident. God has given those things to those people. In Luke 16, 19, you read of a rich man, and this is how Christ describes him, clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. In Psalm 73, verse 7, the wicked are described this way, their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. So we aren't going to say that God does not give them good things. Of course God gives them good things. But the question is, are those good things God's blessing to them? Are those good things a sign of God's grace and favor?
toward them? Does God have an attitude of love toward them when he gives them those things? Is God speaking good upon them in giving them those things? Or is there perhaps a different purpose in God why he has given on the wicked such things? On the other hand, we have the fact, the undeniable fact, that many of God's own children do not possess the abundance of things that the wicked have. And that again is according to God's sovereign providence and good pleasure. Pharaoh was sitting in his palace, living sumptuously every day as a leader of the then known world. What were God's people doing? They were living in misery as slaves. Nebuchadnezzar, again, living in the lap of luxury. Where were God's people? God's people, again, were oppressed, poverty-stricken, and persecuted. We read about the rich man in Luke 16, living sumptuously every day, clothed in purple and fine linen. Who is sitting outside of his gate? A certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. He was a child of God. He was covered with sores, and the dogs licked him. And in Psalm 73, 14, Asaph, who is a believer, is contrasting his own situation with that of the wicked who live their eyes out with fatness and so on. He says, all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. And so the question is again, does God plague and chasten his children? Are they poor and sick, destitute and persecuted because God is cursing them? Is God speaking evil upon them by not giving, him, giving them these things which other people have? Or does God perhaps have a different purpose in these things? So the issue is not how much or how little does God give to the righteous or to the wicked in this life? But rather, why? And with what attitude? And with what purpose does God give the wicked these things? We must remember that God's attitude toward the wicked, the reprobate wicked, is always one of hatred and wrath. In everything that God gives to the wicked, he is cursing them. He is pronouncing evil upon them. Now that might sound harsh, but think about it. God is holy. God is just. How could God bless the wicked? Far be it from God to bless the wicked. How could God pronounce good upon the wicked? He can't. It would be against his very nature to do such things. So what is the explanation? Well, the explanation is found in Psalm 73, verse 18. The psalmist who had been complaining that on the one hand the wicked are, are doing so well in this world that their eyes stand out for fatness, they have more than heart could wish, and on, on the other hand he himself was plagued and chastened every morning, understands when he goes into the sanctuary of God. Surely, he says, thou didst set them in slippery places. The idea there is that the wicked are standing upon a slippery place and God comes to them and piles upon them 
much riches. Now what is going to be the result of that? If you are walking on thin ice, thin, slippery ice, and someone comes along to you and says, here I have a gift for you. It's a big box of gold. Here you are. What's going to happen to you? You're going to fall and slip through that thin ice. You might say a big box of gold bars is a wonderful gift, but not for someone who's walking on thin ice. And that's the case with the wicked. They're walking on thin ice, and God gives unto them riches, and honor, and good health, and all kinds of other good gifts. And the ice breaks under them, and they fall, and they slide straight into hell. That's not God's blessing to them. That's God's curse. That's God's wrath. Now the Catechism brings this out, a distinction between God's gifts on the one hand and God's blessings on the other. Notice that in the Catechism. Neither our care nor industry, nor even thy gifts, can profit us without thy blessing. In other words, we could have thy gifts and not have thy blessing. And our prayer is that we might have thy gifts with thy blessing. So when the wicked man eats and drinks, he eats and drinks, not under God's blessing, but under God's curse. But when we, his children, eat and drink, we eat and drink under his blessing. Really, the wicked man, the reprobate wicked man, is living as an unwelcome guest in God's world. And God puts up with him for a while, for the number of days of his life. God puts up with him, bears long with him, because God has a purpose with him. And once that purpose has been fulfilled in the life of the wicked man, God will expel that man from his world into hell. In the meanwhile, the wicked man is living in God's world. He sees God's world all around him. He uses the good things of God's world that God has provided. But the wicked man does not have any right to them. And he uses them, does the wicked man, always in the service of sin. So every morsel of bread that the wicked man eats is used in the service of sin. And so the wicked man does not have the right to pray, give us this day our daily bread. That the wicked man lives in God's world, enjoying God's sunshine, enjoying God's rain, eating God's food, helping himself to everything else that God has provided in this world, is not a blessing to him as long as he lives, but rather it increases his condemnation. Fast forward, if you will, to Judgment Day. On the last day, God will ask the wicked man, I give you life. I give you good health. I give you food in abundance every day of your life. I show my sunshine upon you. And how did you repay me? Were you thankful? Did you seek my face? Did you love my son? Did you worship me? Did you keep my commandments? Did you love my church? Did you believe my word? No. No, you didn't. And then God, 
will show on the day of judgment how dreadfully wicked those wicked men are. He gave them so much, and they repaid him with sin and with rebellion. And God will be able to display his justice in condemning such wicked people to hell. And the sobering fact of the matter is this, that the more that they had in this life of the things of the world, the more of the good gifts that God gave them, the heavier and more severe will be their condemnation and punishment. Therefore, you can't say it's grace or mercy or blessing to them. In fact, it would have been better for them if they had not received all of those good gifts from God. In fact, it would have been better for them if they had never been born. Not God's blessing, God's curse. Now the world is under the curse of God because of man's sin. Remember what God said in Genesis 3. Cursed be the earth because of you. And the world therefore brings forth only curses to the wicked man. So how then can we, who are also sinners, make this petition to God, give us this day our daily bread, and expect that the world will bring forth blessings to us. Expect that God will bless us in the eating of our daily bread. And the answer, of course, is only one possibility, and that is Christ. Even something as earthly and seemingly commonplace as our daily bread comes to us from the cross of Christ. We have no right to eat our daily bread and expect the blessing of God except the cross. That's why we pray. And that's why we teach our children to pray traditionally as well. Lord, bless this food and drink. Forgive my sins for Jesus' sake. We, unlike the wicked, can eat our daily bread in good conscience because our sins have been forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we would be in exactly the same position as the wicked, whose daily bread is a curse unto them. Just think about that. Every piece of bread that we eat comes to us in God's blessing only because of Jesus Christ. Not because we deserve it, not because we worked hard for it, but because Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we might have it. And Christ was cursed on the cross so that we might be blessed in eating our daily bread. The effectual word of God's wrath came out against Jesus Christ. He who is the ever-blessed, eternal Son of God. And God pronounced evil upon Jesus Christ. And God turned his face against Jesus Christ in anger. And God thrust Jesus Christ away from him into the misery of hell on the cross. So that we would be blessed. Either our perfect substitute dies under the curse of God. Or we must be cursed forever. And such was God's love for us, beloved, that he did not spare his only begotten Son that miserable curse. And such was Christ's love for us that he was willing to come and put himself under that curse 
to be made a curse for us on the cross, so that all those for whom Christ died are blessed in him, even in the eating of their daily bread. Now this fourth petition, Christ reminds us that God our Father is the source of all good, even that good of our daily bread. You might think first that this petition is not necessary, but it's very necessary because Christ wisely understands that we need to pray this. Because we are all naturally prone to trust the creature instead of God. That's the idea of the Catechism here. We are tempted usually to trust in our care or our industry. All of our planning and scheming and hard work. And when that fails, we turn to family and friends or to the government to give us uh, social welfare. And when all of that fails, when the creature fails, we don't know where to go. And perhaps then, and only then, will we decide to go to God as a last resort. But Jesus here teaches us to pray first, Father, give. Give. Don't sell us some bread. Don't lend us some bread until we can pay you back later. But give us bread. Give us bread as a free and undeserved gift. So weak and dependent are we, Father, that we require thee for even the next slice of bread upon our plate. So we call to our Father humbly, but confidently, that God will give us bread. <coughs> he knows we need bread. And so we pray, Father in heaven, give unto us this day our daily bread. And so the fourth petition is, as the Catechism says, an acknowledgement that we may thereby acknowledge thee to be the only fountain of all good. That's really what all prayer is, an acknowledgement or a confession. Not a shopping list for things we want, but an acknowledgement. We do not have these things. We have not got the ability to give ourselves these things. And also thanksgiving that God has given us these things. Let us then, beloved, as we think about this petition, never fail to see that every slice of bread comes to us from the hand of our Heavenly Father. And let us rejoice too that He gives us more than mere bread. With our bread, He gives us His blessing, and He enables us through the bread, through the strength we receive from this bread, to serve him in hallowing his name, in promoting his kingdom, and in fulfilling his will. And let us therefore withdraw all trust from all creatures, and place all of our trust in our heavenly Father alone from whom we receive, and from whom we expect to receive all of our earthly needs, for Christ's sake. Amen. Father, we confess that we need Thee for even our daily bread, and we need Thee more for the blessing that we seek with that bread. We thank Thee that Christ was cursed, that we might be blessed, we ask the Lord that will keep us from sin and cause us to remember each day that thou art our Father who loves us for Christ's sake. Amen.